Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining the September edition of uh, Scarlet Education Society webinar series. I am your moderator, Dr. Ashley Tucker. I am so excited to welcome Dr. Nathan Schramm. He will be speaking to us tonight about mastering scleral lens fitting, tips, tricks, and troubleshooting for streamlined results. So a little bit about Dr. Dr. Schramm. So Dr. Schramm is a proud is proud of co-founding the International Congress of Scleral Contacts, otherwise known as ICSC, the first conference dedicated to scleral lenses. Dr. Schramm also established the Scleral Lens Practitioners Facebook group. If you're not on it, you definitely should join it, fostering a thriving global community for knowledge sharing and collaboration with over 7,000 ECPs. Additionally, he's a fellow among only 250 worldwide of the Scleral Lens Education Society. Devoting his full-time efforts to patient care, Dr. Nate sees an impressive 80% of his day dedicated to specialty, specialty lens patients in Orange County, California. And I'm pretty sure he absolutely loves it, right, Dr. Schramm? <laughs> absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, all of his uh, disclosures, there, but he has no financial disclosures to um, be mitigated at this point, or they have been mitigated, excuse me. So just a little bit, if you haven't joined us before about our Q&A feature and our chat feature, please feel free during the webinar just to put your questions into the Q&A or the chat box. We'll address them at the end of Dr. Schramm's um, talk. In order to get CE credit, you must remain online for a minimum of 50 minutes for COPE credit. Attendees are welcome, but of course not obligated to stay on for the Q&A at the end. But I can tell you if you do, it'll be an en enriching couple more minutes. If you haven't already downloaded the OE Tracker app, please feel free to do so. You really need to do that before we get started. You can get it on the Apple App Store or on the Google Play Store. Um, at the end of the webinar, I will provide you with a QR code that you can simply scan and you will be able to get credit that way. CE certificates will also be emailed within two weeks of our webinar. All right, so that is all for me. I am going to stop sharing my screen, Dr. Schramm, and pass it over to you. Okay. Let's get this screen shared here. And input presentation mode in one second. And we will switch that. All right, welcome. I'm super excited to be here. No financial disclosures. Uh, a little bit about me. Thank you, Dr. Tucker, Tucker for the great introduction. Uh, when I first started clinical practice, I worked in an MD OD practice and was seeing like six patients an hour and uh, quickly realized that um, my passion isn't uh, volume. My passion is uh, especially lenses. So. My wife and I, who's also an optometrist, we decided to um, move a little bit further south to South Florida and uh, open our own specialty lens practice. When um, and we were right across the street from Cleveland Clinic, so I, I started networking. I was in charge of marketing, and my wife was in charge of um, fighting with insurance com companies. So I go over to Cleveland Clinic and talk to the uh, cornea specialist there, and he goes, "Hey, do you fit sclerals?" And in my mind, I'm like. I do now. <laughs> so what I immediately did was signed up for a, a, a scleral lens workshop. This was maybe 2011. And uh, I did a workshop at Nova Southeastern. Then I said to the uh, Cleveland Clinic cornea specialist, I'm like, hey, I'm having uh, a new lens coming to my office. I didn't quite say it was a new lens for me. It was a new lens for both me and uh, was just launched. So uh, he was like, yeah, let me send, I'll send you a few patients. So we got like four or five patients on the schedule. And uh, it was pretty much uh, uh, love at first sight uh, doing uh, especially lenses. Uh, I Because I loved it so much, I'm like, I'm, I'm a member of uh, uh, the company that does vision by design. They have a really great uh, Facebook, uh, 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 Google group. I'm like, I wish I had something like this on Facebook. So during a, a EHR conference, I decided let's create scleral lens practitioners. And uh, once the following got bigger, I was able with the help of Bill Trattler to 
uh, talked to a uh, company that makes uh, does conferences and uh, hence uh, Tom Arnold and I started the International Congress of Spiral Contacts, which is the first conference dedicated solely to spiral lenses. And I'm pretty proud of that. Uh, now I am in a busy uh, private practice, uh, but busy isn't busy like 40 or 50 patients a day. It's like 12 patients or so. And uh, the past uh, few days, I can't even, I've done one primary care exam the whole day. And I was like, oh, how is this plano minus a quarter on my schedule? And it's like, oh, you see, you're you're treating the patients for the 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 children for myopia control. I'm like, oh, okay, that's it. So all four of us uh, ODs at the practice do myopia control, myopia management, and um, two do VT. And uh, Dr. Mai and I, who are both fellows of the Spiral Lens Education Society, are um, the uh, Spiral Lens docs at the practice. So uh, this is a question for you. Um, I know there's people who may be driving and can't look at the presentation, so I'll read it out for you. Uh, which century did glass and fluid on the eye show could correct refractive error? Was it A, the 14th century, B, the 16th century, C, 17th century, D, 20th century, or E, the 21st century? And you may think it was um, you know, 20th century, but actually, in 1508, Da Vinci filled a bowl with water and placed a man's face into it. And that man could see clearly for the first time, but obviously that's not the most practical way to wear a uh, contact lens or glasses. And so I was like, I, if I was alive back in 1508, I probably would have said, put on a snorkel gear and uh, you ever see those mirrors? Um, <laughs> that's uh, some, when you do, um, uh, what do you call it, the surgery where we do a bubble in the eye because of uh, ERM or macular hole. They have to walk around with a mirror and face down. So that would have been a good uh, good way to continue that. Um, then in 1636, um, what's his name? Uh, Rene Descartes, Descartes uh, proposed another idea of placing a glass um, tube filled with liquid in direct contact with the cornea. Problem was you couldn't blink. Uh, so it wasn't that practical, and uh, it didn't quite make it on the postage stamp. Uh, in 1827, though, uh, the English astronomer Sir John Herschel proposed the idea of making a mold of the person's eyes. Oh, wow, a mold of the eyes. I haven't heard of that one before. And um, But not until another 50 years later did actually some, uh, someone come up with a, uh, a way to make it. Uh, so scleral lenses, they're the newest thing, right? Well, I kind of alluded to, they're not. This is a video from back in, I believe it's 1940s. This girl is wearing glasses. Don't believe it? Well, it's true, and here's how it's done. To make contact lenses, the eye is anesthetized, then Sydney optician Penryn Thomas, Australia's only contact lens maker, inserts an impression cup containing a material for taking a cast of the entire eyeball. The mold sets in two minutes and then it's removed. A perfect impression. Contact lenses are a boon to actors, are worn by several film stars, jockeys and athletes. Yes, even glasses are made to measure today. Now the cast is put into a press and the plastic lens itself is molded. The lens is shaped to fit its wearer's eye and also to give the same visual correction or aid that would be given by normal glasses. Now the lens is cut to shape from the plastic square and it's ready for grinding. The plastic is unbreakable and two lenses cost 45 guineas. In America, where the new look is popular, lenses cost 75 pounds. The inside surface of each lens is ground first, a delicate operation demanding a fine degree of precision. Instruments measure accuracy, determining if the lens fulfills its optometric prescription. Then the tiny eyeglass receives a final buffing. There's still a spectacle case to leave lying about, but of course it's smaller. I was just talking to Troy at AccuLens. Lenses are fitted, um, minor adjustments are made, then a buffer solution is placed on the eyeballs and, and the lenses are inserted. Artistic people who Contact lenses can be worn for about six to eight hours without discomfort. Slight haziness after this time can be remedied by removing the lenses for a few minutes. Contact lenses, invisible and comfortable. A new look that's here to stay. And I agree, it's a new look that's here to stay. Right. So 
Um, I wanted to poll the audience. We'll be able to um, put up the, the uh, poll because I want to find out uh, what type of um, uh, expertise we're dealing with here. What's your level of scleral lens fitting? Zero fits, one to 10, 10 to 50. 50, more than 50 or more than 500. And I'll give you, what, maybe 10 more seconds to vote. My next slide is going to be talking about the evolution of star lenses. But let's see, do we have an answer here? How do we see the results of the survey? Okay, large percentage, Dr. Schramm, is 1 to 10 is 33%. And we have zero fits is 19%. 10 to 50 is 28 percent over 50 is 16 percent and over 500 is five percent okay all right so th that is really good it'll uh, allow me to know so we're about 50 percent have been uh less than 10 fits okay there's the there's the numbers thank you all right, so um, my Bosch and Lam rep, uh, Bill Shelley, had showed me this uh, lens here. That on the right hand side, on the left hand side, is a uh, glass scleral lens from the uh, probably designed in the 1930s. Because back in, in 19 late 30s, early 40s, when PMMA lenses became a thing, and their DK was zero. Uh, Acuity 200 um, in 2021 uh, has a as a DK of 200. And this patient down in the bottom right is, uh, he's the self-proclaimed king of keratoconus. Uh, that is a very deep sagittal height. It's about 9,000 or nine millimeter sagittal height there. Uh, so what, why do we fit scleral lenses? The, the main reasons that we fit scleral lenses is gonna be for, uh, my slide's not moving. Oh, I bet you, oh, there we go. Um, primarily, my the main uh, reason that I do it is ectasias or irregular astigmatism, and that can come from you know LASIK, post LASIK, post BRK, uh, keratoconus, uh, corneal transplants. Uh, dry eye is a little bit less. Uh, I actually have an ongoing study right now. I have forty patients in a dry eye study, and I'll tell you that uh, there's more dropout in patients that wear drop wear scleral lenses for uh, dry eye. Um, I'm, I haven't finished the study yet, but I, I know it's, uh, I would guess it to be like around 15% uh, dropout because of comfort issues. The um, high refractive error, I don't do too much scleral lenses for high refractive error, but I do have a, a case that I'm gonna share with you of a minus 14 that uh, was blown away by the vision. Uh, Dr. Denier and uh, several other of my uh, scleral lens heroes like uh, Van der Warp and Jedlica and Lange Michaud and Dr. Morrison, they're all um, some of the best in the field. They did a great study on um, the shape of the sclera and the shape of the sclera, only about 5% is uh, spherical, whereas um, most are toric or, or irregular. And when we look at the numbers for my own fitting, um, in the past uh, 10 months or so, I've fit about 513 lenses. And somehow I have a little bit more spherical than we'd expect. Uh, there's 18% uh, of mine were spherical. Uh, also, sometimes we charge a little bit more for non-spherical, so maybe that's a uh, reason. And um, the highly customized, where we uh, do uh, based on uh, scans of the eye uh, within like 10 microns, uh, do about 20% here. Uh, back toric is the is the main thing where you're going to be correcting uh, these three here. Uh, when we have the, uh, lots of irregularity, that's when we have to go to the highly customizable lenses. So this is just another way of looking at about 65% of the patients are going to need uh, special 
lenses. Um, you'll notice when you're fitting scleral lenses that the right lens has a tendency to um, go down and out. And uh, that's uh, because of the insertion of the medial rectus. And some people it's a little bit different. It doesn't always go down and out. Uh, but the medial rectus is uh, part of the reason why typically the lens decenters uh, temporal and sometimes inferiorly. The um, maximum size of a scleral lens would probably be around 23 or 24 millimeters because of the insertion uh, from here to here is about 24 millimeters, actually a little bit more than 24, maybe 24.2. Uh, the further, the bigger the lens, the more irregularity you're going to have. Uh, this is a Pacific scleral lens study and measured 96 eyes. Uh, the cord length was either set to, uh, we'll look at the 15 millimeter here and the 20 millimeter here. And you can see how the angle difference is bigger uh, the further you go away from the limbus, so the limbus would be somewhere around here. And in all gazes, it's like, in most of the gazes, it's like that, um, whether it be comparing the, the um, this is the 15 millimeter compared to the 20 millimeter. So um, here we have a 38.5 temporally, and here it's 41.8. So there's the, the take home point is uh, you're going to need more toric peripheral curves with scleral lenses because. Uh, the, the bigger the diameter of the lens. And when I first started fitting spiral lenses, I was doing a lot of blank. I guess I can't say the names of them. <laughs> it's COPA proof. I was doing a lot of like 14.9 and even more like 14.3 uh, lenses. Uh, I've since um, increased the size. So we're usually around 16, depending on how big the uh, cone is. So um, I plan to show you how to efficiently fit a patient, and patients are referred to my clinic already expecting to be fit in a specialty lens. Uh, the testing grid is, uh, we tried to um, make it so that our technicians can just read a grid and know what to do. Uh, there's a lot of business books that talk about that. And so if you want to screenshot this, this is a good way because it even tells you, like, tells the technician, put down a paper towel, plungers, addy pack, this fluorescein strip, contact lens case. All, all this is important uh, to have the room set up, not only you know putting in the lenses, but being efficient with having your supplies there all ready for you. Uh, we also have testing grids for myopia management, uh, ortho-K, ortho-K renewals, uh, VT consults, ortho-K dispense, ortho-K follow-up, uh, atropine follow-up, scleral lens dispenses, hybrid dispenses, rigid uh, RGB dispenses. Uh, and this just shows you back in 1951, Things haven't really changed that much. Hello, Mrs. Smith. How are you today? Oh, I'm here. I have a really bad dream. And so uh, he's taking the case history. There's no sa sound to it. Uh, it interesting, he writes, uh, there's no allergies. And she, her complexion, she sunburns and browns later. Uh, interesting thing. Is he going to be is he going to be doing IPL? Because that's what we asked for, for IPL. Uh, but yeah, there he goes with the... Um, uh, trial lenses, and he's doing an open space. I have a tendency to do that quite a bit as well. Um, she was a minus 14 and a minus 15, so pretty big refractive error. Myopia has been around longer than um, uh, the, the past 20 years, that's for sure. All right, so uh, when we're doing the scleral lens consult, the uh, technician, my technicians do a OCT of the macula on every patient. Sometimes they're Corneas are so irregular that we can't get a good scan, and then I'll do a scan once we have the scleral lens on the eye. Uh, but in this case, uh, we're showing some active degeneration. I had a patient um, a few years ago that she had uh, macular diabetic macular edema and was just referred over to me because she had keratoconus, which was true. She did have keratoconus, but we were only getting her to 2200, and yeah, it was the macular edema that was the limiting factor, and that was when the aha moment, uh, that was maybe eight years ago, we got to do OCT on every patient. Tomography on all patients, uh, important to check the um, posterior float. I probably should have put a slide with the posterior float on there, but uh, I have other slides with it. And uh, this is a pretty normal, fairly normal eye there. Uh, so good clinical pearl, uh, PMD, plus marginal degeneration, uh, one of my cornea specialist friends, uh, Jenny Wu, um, she's a little bit more uh, 
uh, blunt with her, maybe uh, with her female patients, she can get away with this. And she explains to them how the, uh, uh, the cornea goes down and out. I kind of uh, like to explain it. Uh, so it goes down and out with gravity. You can see on the right side, it's uh, displaced temporally, down and out, and uh, left side, same. Um, it, to me, it's more like a, a guy with a belt on his um, thin in where the belt is, but down below is uh, where the uh, cornea is protruding. And this is a great pearl from uh, Zachary Carnes over at uh, Moorfield Eye Hospital in, the, in Dubai. Uh, he works in a primary keratoconus clinic, but I don't have to do that many uh, refractions of patients that um, are coming in for glasses. But since he told me about this, I've been checking this on patients that we don't have a pair of glasses. And quite often, if you have a spherical equivalent and just do a high amount of sill with a little bit of plus there, and then you dial in the axis based on what the uh, topography says, uh, or just spin the dial until spin the dial until um, they see it's clear. Uh, it's pretty accurate that you end up with a decent uh, glasses prescription, decent as in like 2070, 2050, by doing a, a big spherical equivalent. Usually, if they're a younger patient, I might uh, push more towards myopia because they do have a longer axial length. And retroillumination. With this uh, on the, one of our machines, we can show how this nipple cone, uh, for those of you who are doing uh, myopia control, if you put on a soft multifocal, you can actually see where the soft lens is decentered. So uh, some of these companies, we can actually decenter it. We can move the optics so that it's recentered. And uh, we also check the, the pupil size. I've been gathering uh, higher order aberration data although I can't really do much with it with this particular machine, uh, but it's good for patient demonstration. You can see all these lines are all scattered and uh, it gives you a, uh, information on the overall 0.62 low order as well. And uh, this one does a, a um, an auto refraction as well. In the future, I'm hoping that um, this machine will be able to do it better for me, but I know that there's another machine that's coming out that instead of doing a a static view, it's a temporal view. So 30 seconds of a scan of all the higher order aberrations. Uh, because if I did the scan twice, we probably have two different results. But if you do a 30 second scan, it's going to give you a lot better uh, reproduci reproducibility. And there's actually a company that's working on that for spiral lenses. So it's pretty exciting times that we live in. Uh, with the case report, uh, I try to build instant rapport because uh, I only have about 15 minutes, 10-15 uh, minutes for the introduction with the patient. So if, if you uh, mirror a patient, if you mirror somebody, you can build um, instant rapport. Uh, all you do is just say the last three words that they said, and that's uh, considered a mirroring, because people are drawn to what is sim similar, and they fear what is different. Some common complaints for uh, those that do a lot of primary care. If you hear these complaints, uh, they should run, run up alarm bells for maybe we're dealing with an irregular cornea. Uh, the eye doctor is my most anxious visit because they, they can't pick better one or two. And uh, that's, uh, that's a good one. Also seeing superscripts over every letter, shadows over every letter uh, on the eye chart. That's a good uh, reason to maybe think that uh, they have irregular corneas, maybe early keratoconus. Ask about contact lens history. Uh, it's good to know what their failures are because uh, quite often they'll come to me that they had um, bad fogging or bad end of day redness or insertion issues. Um, in this particular patient down here, they have some, uh, what we're looking at here is um, the scleral lens is on top. This is a cross section of the, of the cornea. Uh, cornea is right here, and then right where these fluffy things is, is part of the tear layer, and that's actually midday fog right there. And a little bit about midday fog, Dr. Walker, Maria Walker has done some fantastic research on this. Part of her PhD was uh, uh, looking at midday fogging, and uh, midday fog is actually made up of fat, uh, water, I'm sorry, not water. <laughs> I'm used to telling patients what uh, your tears up are made up of. Your tears are made up of protein, water, and and um, and fat. 
So um, this, this is made up of fat, protein, and not water, but cells. Uh, usually the cells are present when you have the chamber of the scleral lens uh, with no with no um, tear exchange. But if there's lots of tear exchange, you're probably gonna have more uh, fat from the meibomian glands. And so her summary is that um, the cells in the um, tear layer, uh, she calls it the FR, she calls it something different, but that's the tear, the tear reservoir. Uh, the are mainly cells in there are from neutrophils or uh, epithelial cells, and then the lipids are coming from the meibomian glands. And the proteins, interesting enough, she hasn't published it yet, but there's evidence that there's inflammatory proteins in that tear reservoir. My uh, tips are look for a leak. If you already have fluorescein in the eye, you can still look for tear exchange by putting some listamine green in the eye. Uh, you have to be pretty generous with the listamine green though to be able to look for the uh, look on the edge of white light to see where it's uh, rushing in from. Uh, so that's a, a tip from the trenches. Uh, to prevent midday fog, there's a bunch of different things you can do, but usually putting a more viscous drop in is a good starting point. Uh, sometimes I'll have the patients grab like a, a it kind of looks like a, a shot glass and you fill up with saline and you just put it to the eye before you put it in the scleral. So rinsing out the eye with saline prior uh, could be helpful. And even putting in uh, like a um, mast cell stabilizer is one of the over-the-counter ones or a, a prescription one. Uh, Let's see. And then also sometimes uh, making the fit a little bit tighter can help, but then you can run up with other issues with tightening the fit. Uh, for those of you that have done lots of fits, um, the, Dr. Walker is doing a study. If you want to scan this QR code, it would be really helpful to help enroll patients to who are determining how much microbial keratitis is occurring from scleral lenses. And it would be really helpful if you can participate it doesn't take uh, much of your time. I have one of my uh, fourth year students. No, is she my fourth year? No, I have one of my uh, one of my technicians who wants to be a student, uh, an optometry student, is helping me work on this process with with my fourth year. All right. So ask who referred your the patient because they're great. You never want to say a bad word about the referring doctor because there are some patients that will be salty saying, I've been seeing the same doctor for six years and he never knew or she never knew that I had keratoconus. And I'm like, look, look at the, the we we have this mapping technology that not everybody has. And uh, it's not something that uh, a regular doctor should have. That's why you were sent here because this is what we do every day. It's really difficult to see. When I looked at your eye with the slit lamp, I couldn't tell that you had keratoconus. I had to look at this map to know it. And this is when a patient has mild keratoconus. So praise, never, never a bad word about uh, another doctor. It's just good karma. Uh, if I had time, I'd ask if they have kids uh, or dogs. Uh, this is my beautiful wife, Julie, and our Siberian Husky is now 14 and a half years old and still alive and kicking and, and uh, hanging out. And my wife brushed her teeth. <laughs> so, you know, she's, a, she's a, I, got, I got good gals at home. I uh, would ask about kids because about 10% have, uh, have a genetic component for keratoconus. And since we do a lot of myopia management and we're with, um, with a company that that uh, asks us to do um, no charge screenings. So I'll say to them, hey, and it's just a really quick exam, bring your kid in, we'll do a myopia consult and we'll check the axial length and we'll do a map of the cornea and we can screen for a uh, keratoconus. It's, it's a really good added on benefit. And then if there's uh, something medical, then we can turn it into a medical visit and a follow up. Uh, let's see, so pearls, only 10% are genetic. Ask the spouse if the patient is rubbing their eye, because a lot of times the patient is like, no, I don't rub my eyes. And um, I saw a video one time about they asked patients to like, how do you rub your eyes? And it was pretty scary how patients with keratoconus rub their eyes. Um, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, one of the quick screening ways is to, um, it's a reverse namaskar. So doing like that, but having, having it in reverse. <laughs> 
I just happen to be able to do it, but I don't have um, EDS. Uh, that touching the tongue to the nose and um, uh, also hyperflexibility, that's the thing that I don't have, like pulling the pulling the thumb all the way to the to the wrist would be hyperflexibility. And uh, that, those are good and are very highly correlated with uh, EDS. Uh, Dr. Arce in Brazil, who's a fantastic cornea specialist who wrote a textbook on uh, keratoconus, him and Bill Trattler, um, he believes that environmental biometric pressure is uh, associated with keratoconus. And, uh, you, you do find in higher elevations that it's uh, more common. 50% of 50% um, uh, of keratoconus will progress within 16 years if you have a unilateral keratoconus. And I just had one today. He was how old was he? He was about 40 and no keratoconus in one eye. So we'll see. Uh, I haven't we haven't done cross linking on him yet. And uh, but he hasn't been progressing. Ask about eye rubbing, I mentioned that. Um, you can actually undo uh, cross-linking. I, I worked with Bill Trattler a little bit in Miami, who's world-renowned. And his exact quote when I emailed him about it, because I said to him, I heard you say you can undo crossing. He's like, continued eye rubbing increases the patient's risk for requiring a second cross-linking procedure. That's a direct quote from Bill Trattler. And, um, this is from me, knuckle rubbing is worse than finger rubbing. So doing something like that versus what my statue here is doing, that statue is causing keratoconus. If I have time for it, I mentioned to the patient that Ikigai, that's the, uh, Lucy translates the meaning of life. This is from that book. Uh, when you find something you're good at, that you is good for the world and uh, what you love, that's Ikigai to me. I usually don't mention it to the patient that you can also get paid for it. That's the true Ikigai. <laughs> what you love, what you're good at, what's good for the world and what you get paid for. Uh, next step, now I've seen the patient, I already know that the patient has um, some irregularity to their uh, cornea as well as the white part of the eye because we've done tomography that has a CSP function. Uh, so it maps out the cornea. But then we also have a, another scope lens mapping that we do and that I order. And uh, there's a few different ways to map the cornea. Uh, for many years, I've worked without this instrument. For only a year, I've had this instrument, and it's a game changer. Uh, what, I actually have two of these instruments. That's how much is a game changer. And uh, yeah, so this, this takes the, and I'll talk more about it, but um, in um, one of the instruments donated this slide, and shows how um, from several studies that statistical significance, uh, scleros are more regular, uh, much more regular than irregular corneas. Uh, anterior corneal parameters are presently moderately associated with levels of scleral asymmetry and uh, keratoconus size. And yeah, you can, you can read uh, that slide. Um, this, this uh, but so then we got, this is the one that I do. Dr. Mai is sitting there very proud, standing there very proud with our newest device. And uh, he's actually been using this, uh, not this one, um, his other machine for probably six years. I haven't been with his practice um, as long, uh, but it's a, uh, it's a match made in heaven. We're, we're doing really uh, good work here. Uh, so know before you go, uh, one scan is possible with this machine, uh, but you do, uh, and so we have the data design, and it's non-contact. Uh, the cons are we need two staff to do it. Quite often, I'm the one that's um, holding the eyelids because I got the uh, the two-finger uh, technique that down that holds the upper lids, and we bring the chin very far forward on the uh, above the chin rest. Sometimes uh, there's uh, issues with if the coin is very scarred, it's hard to get a good reading, but it still gets the data. So sometimes we can just go through the information, uh, but it'll give me um, some strange numbers, but you still have the raw data. Uh, yeah, this is what I was trying to explain that uh, John Gellis is the one who actually taught me this at uh, the ICSC and bring the 
he's in the background there, but bringing the chin past it, it, it opens the eye a little bit more. It changes the angle of the eye. And then I come in from uh, holding from above and keep the upper lid open while I uh, depress the lower lid with one of the uh, silicone tips that they have. Uh, and this is the raw data. In this particular case, uh, here we have a white spot because it wasn't able to, it was like, wow, that's so high, that's so elevated that it was like, uh, I'm not gonna use that data, uh, but the data is actually there. So in the future, I think this machine will allow the operator to uh, use that data. So what we ended up doing with that patient, I'll show you later, we did actually we did this machine with that patient and um, same thing, no before you go, you got the data design, there's no contact. Uh, it's consistent with the, with the scleral lens lab. We just use one lab for this particular machine. And um, I believe it's between eight and 10 microns, depending on what I read, read of the scleral accuracy. Um, the cons are that it takes three scans. Uh, sometimes there's data processing errors. Sometimes uh, it is tear film dependent. So you may have to be putting drops in uh, the um, fluorescent there. Uh, but it's nice that it integrates with one lab because it allows me to pull a lot of data from that one lab. Uh, then with uh, any of the raster stereography, um, this is a, a, the, the third one and uh, they have a 10 micron accuracy, just like the other one. Uh, same two staff uh, to do it. Actually, with this one we can usually do it with one staff. Uh, uh, but not always two. Yeah, I heard it's two staff. I don't have this machine. I heard it's two staff if you want to get um, all in one scan, but I think you do multiple scans with that as well. And it's also tear film dependent. So this is back in 1951. Uh, things haven't changed much. Pull down the upper lid, uh, fill, it, fill it with saline, pop it in the eye. And there we go. I need to get a, a barber's apron for my patients. <laughs> and then back to, and this is exactly what we do. We did an, we did a, um, a uh, stereography or pro profile imagery. Uh, then I do the uh, loose lenses to, to get them to, a, to an endpoint uh, to determine what lens we're going to order. Uh, once we look at them, once the lens is on the eye, uh, you can download this from the uh, Ferris State has this on their website. It, it, it shows you know, the fitting relationship, looking at the spheral lens versus the um, tear layer or tear reservoir, they call it now. Uh, yeah. So then I'll usually do, I'll do an over refraction. Uh, with the over refraction, I do Spiro cylinder, but I almost never order with the astigmatism. Um, my patients have to earn it. They have to earn a front torque because quite often you can be fooled. Even if I have their glasses are minus two axis 90, I find minus two axis 90 with the uh, over refraction over the scleral lens. I've had it where we ordered the scleral lens without that front torque and all of a sudden they're a spherical over refraction. So um, if you had put in that minus two axis 90 and they were truly a spherical overfraction, you, you'd be, it would be tough with that, um, getting it to an end point. Uh, for, the, for the newer people in the audience, this is showing blanching down in the bottom here. And um, we do anterior sago CT. Uh, the sclera lens is there. Um, this is the cornea. Over here is the white part of the eye, the sclera. And... We don't uh, usually do that on a um, first time eval uh, unless I see something tricky that I want to show. Uh, so I did it on this particular one because I want to show them my lab, the amount of blanching because my uh, virtual assistant will know to send them that scan. Actually, I usually have them send all four scans just to um, give them more information. I'd rather give more information than less information. I also have them send a, a picture of most of my notes of the scleral lens fitting to the lab in order to um, give them more data. In this case, uh, we're comparing um, my uh, raster stereography versus uh, slime food. 
And you can see uh, when we're looking at this map, so in the center is the cornea, and then past this black line or past the dotted line is where the, is the limbus. Any areas of depression are uh, darker blue, any areas of elevation are redder or warmer colors. And you can see down here, there's this area of depression, area of depression. And then when we throw on the scleral lens, when we throw on the scleral lens, it's a spherical scleral lens, you can see the shadow here, the shadow is showing a flat area. What does it mean when it's flat? Uh, it means we're gonna need to steepen that area. Uh, when it's flat here, we're gonna need to steepen the edge of the scleral there. So it um, it correlates well. There's good corroboration, there's good correlation with um, you know theoretical and what it actually does. And um, back to the patient who I couldn't get a good scan here. Uh, once we ordered from my raster stereography, I was able to um, vault over that. And uh, that pigmentula is over um, uh, a, uh, a millimeter big, probably two millimeters big. And uh, this is just showing what the raster stereography looks like. This is Schlemflug, and it's on a guy who has a little bit of a pterygium. Let's see. And uh, there's good corroboration between the technology. Let's see. So it gives me an estimate on what um, scleral lens we should throw onto the eye, as well as um, if we're throwing a torque one, it will tell me where that torque marking should line up. And it's usually pretty accurate, like 10 degrees, usually within 10, 20 degrees. Oh, back to 1951, what has changed? Uh, he's grinding it out by hand. Oh, let's uh, make that torque haptic a little bit better. He's a little, she's a little bit flat right there. Uh, we're going to pop it back on the eye. Uh, forget about saline. She doesn't need any saline. Hopefully through a numbing drop on. And then he's going to put some markings. We don't have to mark the lenses anymore. And then out with the old, the, that's one of the way that's a plunger that is like half, uh, it's a little bit half the size of the big DMV and and um, a little bit bigger than the small DMV. All right. Uh, first case, uh, this guy came in, 69 year old male. He had a toric IOL placed into his eye, uh, had LASIK three times. He's had cataract surgery uh, more than once because they had a refractive surprise the first time around, and they had a refractive surprise the second time around. So fortunately, he doesn't, for, fortunately and unfortunately for him, he doesn't have any astigmatism in his glasses prescription. So this is my refraction. He comes in 20, 60 minus out of the right eye. We refract him due to the regular astigmatism. He's 20, 40 with a plus one. And so now you're thinking he's, He's um, 2060, uncorrected. Uh, he doesn't really want to wear glasses, and he only gets to 2040. Um, so what are we going to do to treat him? Uh, we've attempted, so a previous clinic attempted soft lenses, and they attempted RGPs. Uh, would we want to attempt a hybrid? No, we do not want to attempt a hybrid, because that's going to show all the internal astigmatism. And uh, one of the issues with having a having a TORC PCIOL is any of the astigmatism is gonna show up. So should we attempt a scleral lens for distance in both eyes? Well, he's 20-20 out of the left eye, so I probably wouldn't wanna do that at first, first right off the bat, but he is dry eye, so maybe. And then uh, should we just attempt a scleral lens for the right eye because his attempt, because he was supposed to be monovision and he didn't quite make monovision. So yeah, that's what we're gonna do, uh, but with we're gonna need uh, profile imagery or molding technology to make sure the optics are precise because if you have that lens, if you because you're gonna have about three diopters or four diopters of internal astigmatism, if you have a little bit off kilter, he's gonna be miserable. And um, that's what we did. I'll show you more of the case a little bit in a little bit. Um, so a, a pearl for you, primary care docs. If you see, uh, if you're gonna fit a scleral lens and they're 20, 30 or better, you might wanna think twice because 
quite often a scleral lens, uh, the, the HOAs are going to ruin, and if they're a regular cornea, quite often they're already accustomed to their, their higher order aberrations, and quite often the higher order aberrations will be very different once you throw on a scleral lens. Uh, this is one of the um, my maps, and it shows like this was before a scleral lens, and then all of a sudden, and this guy was like a 2030 eye, and his vision is actually worse now um, with uh, with a scleral lens. Dr. Sint has some excellent slides, and she's been working on developing some technology to make scleral lenses better. It, she shows here that how they definitely inverted. This is with a scleral lens, and then this is with a standard scleral lens not one of the special higher order aberration correcting ones, but you can see how it inverted the, um, it inverted the higher HOAs. Uh, when I'm evaluating a, a scleral lens, I like to keep a handheld blue light. Uh, that gets you uh, to a, you can see right away, hey, there's a bubble. Also, there might even be uh, a little bit of a um, uh, touch right there. Um, one of the things you wanna look at is the pupil. If you can see the pupil, then, uh, well, if you can't see the pupil, you probably have too much clearance. Uh, and then if you can kind of see the pupil, you're probably uh, where you need to be. Uh, that's me shining my handheld blue light. And then I stole a couple slides from Dr. Denier. You wanna make sure there's no touch. Uh, do an auto refraction. Auto refraction give me a lot of data. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Sandy Kaufman. He's uh, an older doc a friend of mine, and he had one of the first um, auto refractors. It's huge. <laughs> That's back in 1982. So yeah, this shows how I mentioned how down and out in the right eye has a tendency to be down and out. And uh, this is a trial lens fitting. You can see because the circles are down and out, uh, this lens is a little bit decentered. Also, I look at the um, the K readings. If you have more than an adapter of difference between horizontal and vertical, that's a good indicator that you have some flexure. This one, I, uh, bad video. I didn't get a K reading on that, but I'm sure I did. I just didn't get the good video. All right. And wow, I'm running low on time. Evaluation of spare lenses. Uh, yeah, I mentioned about doing a sphero cylindrical. Uh, always confirm the if you're working with a fitting set that has lens, uh, the lens ID, I definitely recommend, if you're not, I would, because it makes my life so much easier. I've ordered the wrong lens before because I didn't look at the ID number. Uh, so make sure, get in the habit of having your text look at the ID number, have you look at the ID number. Uh, I make it part of the exam that I actually write down the ID number myself into the, into the record. This kind of shows how the limbal vaulting, you want to be looking at the limbal vaulting. Also look at, see if there's any uh, front surface fog. Front surface fog makes me want to order the, the um, uh, polyethylene glycol coating uh, that you can apply to the lens. So patience equals uh, patience. And it took me a few months to get a hummingbird to land on my finger. There you go. Uh, it took me a long time to build a scleral lens practice. Uh, now, at this point in my career, what 10, 10 years ago, my goal was my monthly goal of scleral lenses is now my daily goal of scleral lenses. So it's, it's incredible. Build it and they will come. Uh, on the first dispense insertion, this is, oh, this is Dr. Chandrasekhar. He, hey, um, he came to my clinic okay, and I, this is a neat way to, to insert a scleral lens. You can actually tell the patient to look at their thumb the and then you can use your uh, hand that has the scleral lens in there to pop in the lens. He's using his middle finger there and then his other hand is holding the upper lid. So it takes the patient out of it. They're more active because they're looking at their thumb. I'll show you one more time. Look here with the right hand, okay? Come so into the he's gonna pull down the lower lid with his middle finger, and then the upper hand, the other hand is holding the upper lids. Uh, I like this uh, sea green, it, uh, it gives the patient a good target. That's another way of putting it in, especially if they've never worn a lens before. So that's uh, good to keep in the office at all times. On this first dispense, uh, like I said before, we confirm the number. So we confirm for the trial and for the dispense. 
for retinoscopy. I get out the lens bars. Um, this is one of my best uh, HOA uh, um, detectors. And if you're seeing a shadow, um, not just the reflex, but looking for a shadow, if you're seeing a lot of a shadow, then uh, you're probably dealing with some HOAs. Uh, I, since we have the automated refractors in most rooms, quite often I'm using these uh, prism bars. Some common complaints, the moon is a second oval to it. I've heard that from keratoconic patients and post, like, I've heard it from all sorts of patients, yeah. Uh, so that's an indicator that we're dealing with irregular stigmatism or HOAs. Uh, one of Dr. Synth's sides, this patient has no lens on their eye, but they're keratoconic and they have a blurry E there, um, but they're, they're, they can still squeak by on a 2020. But then when you throw on a scleral lens there and with their correct prescription, the E is all a blur. Yeah, this is a 25 year old scleral. So um, that's why I say don't do 2020 scleral lenses on a you know, keratocone. You want to do 2030 or, or worse, is my rule of thumb. Uh, I had this patient come in who's actually, um, he was like a minus 14 or something like that. His axial length was over 30, I think it was like 31 or 32. Uh, he came in with his lenses were a little bit decentered, de and he's describing to me. Um, that this is how he was seeing, and and um, with with IR on a anterior sego CT, you can actually see the see it pretty well where it's decentered down and out. Hey, that right eye is down and out again. Go figure. Well, we ended up putting um, eccentricity. I did some uh, ret retting on him and kind of looked plus push plus until you see the uh, until you see the shadow neutralized, and then you kind of get an idea. Um, Dr. Stevenson in Australia is doing some fantastic research with that on how much eccentricity you put into the lens. And uh, now this guy is 2020. Uh, he's he said that he's been to all these things. He wants to do them over again because he's looking with new eyes. Like he was one of the guys who just couldn't thank us enough. Uh, that's uh, anterior psycho CT. I know I'm running short on time. All right, we'll skip through that. This is my pterygium guy. Yeah, we have to, have to at least finish this case. Uh, removal. <laughs> I haven't tried this technique yet, and I want to show it. It looks like he's putting his finger either on the upper lid. It must be, yeah, he's got it on the upper lid, and he's rattling it across about the top 180 degrees, and boop. That is cool. <laughs> I know I'm short on time, but I think this is so cool. And boop, okay. Next one. So no stain left behind. We look for staining afterwards, after they've worn it. This is on a follow-up visit because you can only see to about 20 microns of fluorescein. And then uh, this guy with the front, with the internal astigmatism, we had to put our front torque with three diopters. Fortunately, we were able to get it to line up properly and stay stable the whole time. So he's J1 out of his right eye. And the other eye, we don't need anything because he's 20-20. Only glasses he needs now are martini glasses. 